May the 24th be with you. Folks, today isn't just the 150th episode of my show, holy crap. But it wasn't. But it also marks the eve of the 40th anniversary of a little film called Star Wars. On May 25th, 1977, a young filmmaker named George Lucas unleashed his space fantasy that was steeped in mythic storytelling traditions on an unsuspecting public. That public, in turn, went hog wild for it. They bought the merchandise, they dressed up as the characters, they learned all these terms that never actually appear in the movie, Ewok, and they never turned back. Now, four decades later, the influence of Star Wars is stronger than ever, and specifically Episode Four, A New Hope. It can be seen practically everywhere in pop culture. So to celebrate this auspicious anniversary, today's episode of The Dan Cave is all about little-known A New Hope facts that only die-hard Star Wars fans already know. Star Wars is the reason you have to leave the movie theater when the movie's done playing. It's not so they can just clean up the gummy bears you spelled, Jess. On May 25th, 1977, Star Wars opened in 32 theaters across the country. That movie went on to gross $255,000 in its opening day, and word of mouth spread like wildfire. It only got crazier and more profitable from there. But that money didn't necessarily come from repeat viewers, at least not at first. A lot of people saw it multiple times, but back then, most theaters had a policy where you could just stay in the theater as long as you liked if you bought a single ticket. Now, the runaway success of Star Wars actually made them change that policy, forcing you to leave the theater and buy a new ticket. That is, if you weren't sneaky enough to loiter around the lobby and pretend to play Cruise in USA until you could weasel your way into a second film. <laughs> not that I did that. that <laughs> You probably did. Anyway, just, just blame Star Wars. The title used to be dumb as hell. It turns out there's a really good reason that scripts go through multiple revisions. I may have gone too far in a few places. Before it was simply called Star Wars, George Lucas envisioned a much longer title. The second draft of the script was entitled <clears throat> Adventures of the Star Killer, as taken from the Journal of the Wheels, Saga 1, The Star Wars. Jesus. It's kind of like how my show used to be called Cave Quest, The Dan of Cavins, Recollections from the Secret Diary of John Wilkes Booth, Compendium 4, That Old Chestnut. The studio was afraid of Chewbacca's downstairs mix-up. <laughs> now, many of you know that Han Solo's fuzzball of a co-pilot Chewbacca was actually inspired by George Lucas's real-life dog, this giant Alaskan Malamute named Indiana. Got a lot of fond memories of that dog. But studio execs were still worried that audiences would be scandalized by the fact that he was essentially a nudist wearing a bandolier and nothing else except just sh tons of fur. I see your point, sir. Now, apparently studio execs wanted Chewie to wear everything from later hosen to culottes, according to Mark Hamill, and they even drew up concept art of what that would look like. But eventually, George's original vision of a pantsless Wookiee won out, and I think I speak for everyone when I say, let the Wookiee win. R2-D2 wasn't always a little bleeping and blooping sass bot. Everyone's favorite astromech originally had actual lines of dialogue in which he would chastise his gibbering golden compatriot C-3PO. The dialogue, though, was removed in post-production and replaced with the iconic beeps and bloops we know and love today. And honestly, it's ultimately for the best because it actually makes C-3PO seem like this sort of anxiety-addled lunatic rather than just the victim of droid rage. Don't you call me a mindless philosopher, you overweight glob of grease? Darth Vader didn't kill Obi-Wan Kenobi. George Lucas is ex wife did. Though Darth Vader struck the killing blow, old Ben Kenobi's blood is actually on Marsha Lucas's hands. Now, not only did Marsha win an Oscar for editing Star Wars, but she was actually the one who suggested that Obi-Wan bite the bullet, or snarf the saber, I guess. I don't know the term. At first, she suggested that 3PO get shot when Lucas was struggling with how to end the movie. But Lucas said no, because he wanted to start and end the film with droids. So Martha then turned her sights on old Ben. No! It turned out to be exactly the emotional pathos the film needed, and as a bonus, it freed a cranky Sir Alec Guinness from having to spend one more day in uncomfortable robes in the Tunisian heat. Because honestly, that's so hard when you're making, I don't know, something like $88 million off this movie. Get over it, dude. The Millennium Falcon didn't always look as cool as it does now. The original concept model for the Falcon was this long cylindrical spacecraft that was ultimately nixed because it looked too similar to the ship on the British TV show Space 1999. Now, a version of that ship actually made it into the final version of Star Wars as the Rebel blockade runner you see at the very beginning of the movie. As for the Falcon itself, well, legend has it that George Lucas was eating a hamburger with an olive on the side when he looked down at his plate and realized it wasn't a beef witch at all, but rather it was the blueprints for the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy. Now, some online conspiracy theorists don't exactly buy this theory. They think it's actually cribbed from Austrian architect Otto Wagner's 1880 design for a never-built office building, but I think that just sounds like they have beef with the original story. 
Ralph McQuarrie gave Darth Vader space asthma. Did you ever wonder why Darth Vader had such an intense suit of armor complete with a breathing apparatus that puts iron lungs to shame? Well, sure, it's because he didn't have the high ground back when he faced Obi-Wan back on Mustafar, but really, it's because of concept artist Ralph McQuarrie. Now, Lucas originally wanted a samurai influence. After all, he was obsessed with the films of Akira Kurosawa. But McQuarrie felt that something was missing from Vader's original design. In the original script, it called for Vader to travel between spaceships, exposing himself to the infinite blackness of space. So Ralph McQuarrie thought that he needed some sort of specialized spacesuit to help him breathe and survive the void. So McQuarrie drew a mask on him and the rest, as they say, is history. I hate sand. The Force originated in Canada. I know, I know, you thought it was this weird bacteria that turns pod racing phenoms into murderous sand hitting asthmatics, but the Force can actually trace its origins all the way back to a 1963 short film by Montreal filmmaker Arthur Lipset called 2187. After a traumatic car accident, Lucas found himself with a budding interest in film and spent a lot of time in art house cinemas. Now, during one such trip to the movies, he saw 2187 and it left a major impression on him. About three minutes into this movie, there's a conversation between artificial intelligence scientist Warren S. McCullough and cinematographer Roman Kroitor, in which Kroitor says, many people feel that in the contemplation of nature and in communication with other living things, they become aware of some kind of force or something behind this apparent mask which we see in front of us, and they call it God. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. While it's not the only thing to influence the Force, it's definitely one of the earliest. And let's just be grateful that Infinite Jest hadn't been written yet, or George Lucas might have been really insufferable. Star Wars almost featured some very different stars. Now, I've done an entire episode about this before, but there are tons of super famous actors that auditioned for Star Wars, only to turn down a part in the galaxy far, far away, or they just couldn't stay on target in the audition room. Now, before the Carpenter turned world's handsomest grump, Harrison Ford got the role, Sylvester Stallone, Kurt Russell, Robert England, Al Pacino, Christopher Walken, Bill Murray, Nick Nolte, Jack Nichols, and Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and James Caan all auditioned for this part. For my dead body. And speaking of weird casting ideas, George Lucas himself had some very, shall we say, interesting impulses regarding casting. As Ernest Hemingway once allegedly said, it's easy to write. You just sit in front of your typewriter and bleed. Well, with Star Wars, Lucas didn't just bleed, he straight up hemorrhaged. And that led to some, shall we say, impulsive decision-making during the pre-production process. At various points during the movie's production, Lucas considered making Star Wars with an all-black cast, an all-Japanese cast, including Akira Kurosawa stapled Shiro Mifune as Obi-Wan Kenobi, and a cast comprised entirely of little people, which Lucas chalked up to being influenced by Lord of the Rings. Now, that's fine, that's all well and good, but I just have one question. Where the hell are those special editions, George? Or Kathleen? or Robert Iger, or whoever can make this happen. And those, my friends, are some weird but true facts about Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Happy 40th anniversary, Star Wars. But tell me, which is your favorite? What would you add to this list? Let me know in the comments below and give me a thumbs up from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away while you're there. Now be sure to like and subscribe or else you might miss next week's show about the story of two warrior monks who were sent to deal with the blockade of a planet by a trade federation only to uncover a unit of psychic soldiers that can murder barnyard animals with a single stare in Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Men Who Stare at Goats. Until next time, keep on digging. Let's open up the old mailbag, shall we? At Jetpack Paul asks, if you could face slash off with anyone, who would you choose and what would you do? Also, are those chestnut pins still happening? That's a great question, Paul. Well, if I could have a Nick Cage, John Travolta style face off with anyone, I'd want to do it with Mr. Bean because that dude looks positively bonkers and makes some seriously silly faces. I just think it'd be a really fun time. And also really, it'd be make for like a really memorable speedboat fight slash chase at the end of our adventure. Anyway, also yes, those chestnut pins are still happening. If you want to make them happen faster, just tweet hashtag that old chestnut to at Nerdist and let them know. But tell me, who would you want to have a face slash off with? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you guys next time.